Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and I am speaking a little slower in hour two. We had a fantastic uh, first hour, which started with a delicious piece of key lime pie. And uh, now we're back, and we've got the the power panel ready and willing to take your questions. So whatever you have, 877-933-2484. I've got Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. as my panel. So any questions you have, We'd love to get them. All right. In the previous hour, right towards the end, we were speaking about uh, communicating with the dead, and a comment came in from uh, uh, Bartholomew in Connecticut, and he said, I think God allowed for the event involving the Witch of Endor to happen because it clearly states that she was also very surprised, so it's not possible to raise the dead. Yeah. Even the witch was surprised. Yeah. Good That's insight. A good point. She didn't Very see that insight. coming. No. Way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Amen to that. All right. Here's a question, gentlemen. Uh, why doesn't God heal everyone? Well, let's start with physical healing okay. or spiritual healing. This question is a lot easier if you're talking about spiritual healing because he does. Mm-hmm. He heals everyone who asks. Everyone who calls on the Lord, he will save, and he will heal you from the greatest disease of all, and that is uh, sin and death, and you are healed. Now, physically, this is, this is if, if he, you know, this is kind of one of those things, whenever you hear of a miracle that someone says, you know, God has healed me, and I, God can do anything he wants at any time, and I know many, many of us all know stories of People will say, yeah, I think this was a miracle. God healed him and so on. But one of the issues is, is, well, what about the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and this Christian and that Christian? Mm -hmm. What happens when they don't receive their miracle? We know this great promise that he's working all things for good for those who love him. And if you don't receive physical healing, you know this, that he has already healed you in Christ from sin and death. You know, uh, Johnny Erickson Tata After her accident, I remember reading her story one time, and she said she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, went to healers after healers, and then finally one day she was healed of the need to be physically healed. Hmm. And it was then that her ministry took off, and God has used her in amazing ways since. You know, I think Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. I think most of us just want to hear, I've overcome the world. Mm. And we forget that even for the Christian, there's going to be trouble. That could be physical, emotional, a variety of ways. And I know Christians all the time who get diseases, die prematurely, or get killed in car accidents, or go down in in jet planes. And, you know, your choice there is either you say, we have a, a Lord that doesn't know what he's doing, or we come back and say, we don't have a clue what he's doing in the good sense, and he is way ahead of us on this. And quite frankly, uh, I think being in the kingdom of God beats a lot of being in this world. Mm. And so the Lord is there and he cares. And uh, even for the smallest children, you think about all the babies that have been aborted in this country alone. You know, the Lord grieves over that, but it's not the end for those babies. You know, he, they're created in his image. You know, and he's, he is returning he is going to set all things right, and there is a time coming when the righteous will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There will be no more sickness, no more pain, no right. more death, any of that. He he promises he's going to make all things new. In the meantime, we live in a fallen world. That's right. The enemy, the devil, is looking to kill and steal and destroy, so he's roaming around like a, like a lion. There are lost people making very bad decisions. There are believers making poor decisions decisions, right? In this world, there's sickness, there's disease. God says all creation is growing, groaning. So the question is, you know, why isn't everybody healed? It's the, the other question is, why isn't everybody sick? We live in a fallen world. And I think by the grace of God, you know, except by the grace of God, 
go I. You know, we suffer uh, living in this world the consequences of other people's sin. Mm, we yes, may absolutely. be innocent in the matter, but because, for instance, a company could be dumping toxics into the river that's being used as fresh water for a, a town down the road, and they find that so many people have gotten cancer from that. Whose fault is that? It isn't God's fault. It's the sin of that company and the people who represent it that created that problem. Mm-hmm. And we suffer the consequences of it, even though we, aren't, we weren't the ones that have perpetuated it. Yeah, we're all enough to remember the thalidomide babies who got the, the drug the mother did for pain or discomfort, and then the babies came out deformed. And that was a big deal for a long time. And I don't know if that was, I don't know if it's poor, poor science or whatever, but it still was the consequence of what one person did that had an effect on another person, for mm-hmm. good or bad. Mm-hmm. All right, gentlemen, I'm in Psalm chapter 56, starting in verse 4. It says, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And then this verse, number five, all day long they twist my words, all their schemes are for my ruin. I think people have been twisting God's words forever, haven't they? Of course. From the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Did God really say? Yes. The devil in the garden. Mm. He's been twisting and, and distorting God's word. But I love this line, what can mere man or mere mortals do to me? Remember, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not fear him who can destroy the body, our enemy, right? But fear him or awe him who has the power over your eternal fate, right? Fear him. So look, physical death is is a tragedy often, but your second death is the biggest tragedy of all. Those who don't believe, who will face the lake of fire, which is in Revelation, it's called, they're thrown into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That's the biggest tragedy of all. I think one of the great fears I've always had, and the Lord's had to teach me, is that, um, like all the rest of us here, I've been very well blessed, had a lot of education, did a lot of study in the Greek and the Hebrew and all that kind of stuff. The point is, when I go in to study the Word of God now, I have to, and this is going to sound strange at first, I have to leave my Lutheranism at the door. I have to go in and let the Word say what it's saying and then come out and then reinterpret that or see if that aligns, but not go in with that interpretation. And I think, you know, some people twist it for evil. I think many of us twist it out of our ideologies. We don't, I don't think we're trying to be wicked. We're just not thinking it through. And the biggest challenge is to go into the Word and not come in with what you have always had but come in and see what it really says and then grow from there. Yep. You know, I love ver- this verse for uh, Bill. Um, you know, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. We should, like, put that on our currency or something, you know. In God I trust? Yeah. yeah. Jeff, you know, I, I hate to be the one to bring <laughs> oh, this to you. I think it's on there. <laughs> That's good. I hope yeah. it stays there for a long, long time. <laughs> mm-hmm. For now. For now. Mm-hmm. I like that, too. All right, another comment, question. There seems to be a rise of interest in spiritual warfare in the spiritual realm in regards to the Haunted Cosmos podcast and books by, like, Dr. Michael Heiser. And Michael was a, kind of a regular guest on the show here, and he went on to be with the Lord last year. A wow. very, very bright guy. I really liked Michael. Um, but they were curious as to why. Why are these topics become popular? Is it revelation being poured out on believers or are believers looking for something new to study? I I don't think it's the latter. I think that everything that man has put his trust in, humanly speaking, whether it's an organization, a governmental entity, a cult or whatever it might be, has disappointed him or has not been able to answer the questions that they have. And so they're looking now for spiritual answers. I tell my men all along, all the time, that the world is getting darker, but whatever light you have is all the brighter against a darker background. The fact is that this time, this age, is the best time for the gospel because it provides the answers they're not getting from the world. So I think people are seeking, and, and you know, it's God's place to turn into each man's soul, yet not so that he knows what God's done from the beginning to the end. It compels us to ask these kinds of questions uh, over and over again, all about purpose, progress, and permanence. So I think it's, or it, it's, it originates with God, but the circumstances have let them down that they put their trust in, and they're looking for long-lasting and true answers. Yeah, I mean, 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote Ephesians 6, which talks about our spiritual battle. 
And he says, when that day of evil comes, you know, stand your ground and stand firm. And after you've done everything, to stand. So put on the full armor of God. So I think the church was concerned about our spiritual battles that we are in uh, 2,000 years ago, even in the Old Testament. Um, you know, the, the, the lament of the prophet was always, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? I mean, there's this idea of this cosmic battle of good versus evil going on even in the Old Testament. So I, I don't I don't know. Look, there's nothing new under the sun. I don't, you know, maybe we're we're more aware of it in our Western world, but the the church has experienced spiritual battle since the very beginning. I think it's just an awareness issue that's coming back. You know, in Luke, Jesus said that we're made up of heart, mind, soul, and strength, or body. All right, there are four aspects to us. It's easy for me to concentrate on my body. It's easy for me to concentrate on my mind. It's relatively easy for me to concentrate on my heart, which is my decision-making center. But to really focus on the spiritual is something that most of us don't do until we get in trouble. When we get in trouble, then we go looking into the spiritual realm and trying to find answers. Where the Lord is saying, just as much energy as you put into your mind, just as much energy you put into those, you should be putting that energy into the spiritual realm. I think there's a hunger for the spiritual today. And I think the danger is, is that too many people, even Christians, get trapped in it or wind up going to these seances or palm readers or whatever else because they're looking for answers because they're not finding them. And I think the church today is struggling with not coming with a complete answer. I cannot agree with you more, Greg. There are very few churches I hear where I hear any preaching about repentance. Repentance almost doesn't exist. It's how to be a better person. Yeah. It's how to take care of your neighbor. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's only an inkling of the Scripture. It's much bigger than that. But if we don't focus on that, the need is still there, and we go looking and getting the wrong stuff. I drove by and saw a psychic studio with a sign that said, Sorry, we lost our lease. Don't you think they should have seen that one coming? <laughs> I'm just saying. Is that really true, Bill? <laughs> yes, it is, Greg. I <laughs> love it. love it. All right, here's a question. The Bible says wives are to submit to their husbands. Is a husband disciplining their wives acceptable? Probably would like to re-ask the question, but anyway, because uh, I think what we're called to do is to submit to one another, right? That's exactly how that that passage starts about wives submit to your husbands. By the way, we tend to look at the wives section and say, oh, you're supposed to be doing that. And then the women look at the man section. You're not doing that. How about we focus on what it says for husbands to do as guys? Husbands, uh, uh, give yourself up for her just as Christ gave himself up for the church. Women, you worry about the women part. We'll worry about doing the guy part. But but the whole passage starts with submit to one another then. Uh, out of reverence for the Lord. I can't remember the exact mm-hmm. phrase, but submit to one another. Uh, look, we have, submit has become a negative term in English because we, we there are distortions of this throughout the world and in other cultures where men are dominant over the woman in a very submissive relationship in an unbiblical way. Submission is actually a beautiful thing. Christ submitted to his father. Children are to submit to their parents. And when we do, when we have a mutual submission between husband and wife, it's a beautiful picture. Well, the question really is two things that are loosely related, but not closely related. Submitting and then disciplining your wife, those are two different ideas. They have to be separated, I think. And when we're, when you talk about discipline, discipline is the Lord's responsibility for us as followers in Christ. Yeah, I don't see anything in there about disappointing your wife. I see it in disappointing your children yeah. in love, right? Not in anger. Um, and God disciplines those that He loves. I don't. I don't think there's a passage about disciplining your wife anywhere. Do you guys know of any? I don't think. Can't think of one. If, if right. there is, I want to stay away from it. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Cherry picking scripture again. Aren't I'm you sorry. Okay, I got were we leave just that at talking about that? Uh, we're gonna have to talk but, about that. We're gonna take a break though, and be right back with lots more guy talk or guys who talk, and they are ready to take your question. Eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. I'll say that again. Eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. Be right back. Hi, I'm Suzy Larson, host of Suzy Larson Live. You know, following Jesus is not just something we do. It's who we are. 
We follow him because he's the savior of the world. He lived, he died, he rose again and blew the doors off of the devil's claim on us. That's why we can live free and we can share with others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, it's our spring fundraising season and we would love for you to join the Faith Radio family. Tell others about how God has changed your life. Be an ambassador for Christ as you share the good news. And then, if you feel so led, would you join the Giving Family now? You can do so by clicking on the link in the show notes or simply give safe and secure online at myfaithradio.com. Welcome to Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. I've got Greg B., Tom P., Jeff V., that is the power panel, who are taking your questions today, 877-933-2484. I'm in Genesis, uh, gentlemen. I'm in the first chapter of Genesis, and it says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. This sounds very plural to me. Is this the Trinity speaking, uh, or is it God's divine counsel? And what is the divine counsel? Uh, I do. I think that's the Trinity yeah. speaking. Uh, I think it's the first reference uh, in Scripture, right in the first chapter, that the, of the triune nature of God. Look, we know in the Old Testament that God is one, yes. right? The Lord yeah. your God is one, but he has chosen to reveal himself in these three persons. And we see it more clearly in the New Testament, right, where, for example, at the baptism of Jesus, we have Jesus in the water, God's voice from heaven, and the Spirit descending like a dove. God has revealed himself in three persons, even though he's one God. When Jesus said, when uh, Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father, and he says, Philip, have, have I not been, been you all this time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. He is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. I wrote a sermon one time called G- Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, and you could say the same thing about the Holy Spirit. They are there from the very beginning, mm-hmm. and you get to the Colossians. It really gives you that understanding that Jesus was creating in the very beginning. So the the us, yeah, the plurality is there. How long did that sermon last? I don't remember. Is it like nine hours? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I tried to keep it down to three. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, can I just say one oh, more please, thing? There, Jeff. There, there are so many things to be said about the Trinity. Yeah. Um, in the sense that of how it's declared, one of, one of my favorite examples is that in Scripture it says that Jesus, by His power, raised Himself from the dead, yeah. destroyed this temple, and I will raise it up again. It also says that it was by the Spirit. I just read that verse actually in the first hour. It's by the Spirit of God that He raised Him from the dead. And then elsewhere in the New Testament it says God raised Him from the dead. Well, who raised Him from the dead? God did. The Spirit did. Jesus yes. did. They're all God. Of God course. raised Jesus from the dead. Good point. Yeah. yeah. All right. This question, I'm looking your direction, Jeff. Um, I think you'll like this one. I'm in Matthew 24. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and the, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation— spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And the question is, what what is this horrible thing? This abomination that causes des- desolation. Well, yeah, Jesus says that Daniel spoke of it as well. So in Daniel 9, God gave us a picture of this abomination that's going to come in a future seven-year period that we commonly call the tribulation. All of Matthew 24, to understand it, properly, is based on this idea of the question at the start of the chapter. His disciples asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of your age, uh, end of the age? So what are they asking? What will be the sign of Jesus's return at his second coming? And he's now going to give them an entire chapter of clues of things to look for that I believe that proper interpretation is that these things will happen during this future seven-year tribulation, including the abomination of desolation that will be set up at the midpoint, according yeah. to Daniel 9, in the temple of God. Thessalonians says that the this coming Antichrist will set himself up in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. And so Jesus, speaking to Israel, is saying, hey, when you see these things during this future tribulation period, flee, get out of there, 
flee to the wilderness. And, and Scripture in Revelation says that they will be protected in the wilderness for the second half of that tribulation, for the second half of three and a half years. And then at the end of that time, the end will come. The end of the age will come. Jesus will return to earth. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and he will establish his, his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Well done. All right, I always love uh, dipping into Proverbs. And do you guys have Proverbs that that you think of regularly? And Do you read Proverbs regularly? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Proverbs 4.23, Above all else, guard your heart, for from it comes the wellspring of your life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like that. Yeah. What about you, Tom P.? I, that's one I go back to a lot. There are several others. Um, if I had to pull them up right now, I'd struggle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Th- you know, um, can I, I one story. Um, there is, I think this is in Proverbs. I hope it's in Proverbs. Uh, we were at a coffee shop with my daughter, and this guy was evaluating the scales to make sure they were accurate. And I said, to him, just offhandedly, he says, do you know what God says about scales? <laughs> and I, I kind of thought it would be interesting. I mean, that's his profession. He's sure. a professional calibrator of scales, and he was doing it in this copy shop. And he kind of looked at me, and he says, and I said, the Lord loves honest scales. Is that in Proverbs? Or maybe maybe it's not. I believe it is. Is it? I think it is, I should yeah. look it up. And he just kind of looked at me and and had this kind of disdained look and looked back down and continued his job. And I thought it was really fascinating, but, oh, there's so many wisdom lines in Proverbs. It's uh, just, you know, there was a time in my life I read a, a, a proverb and a psalm and a chapter, uh, a section of books every single day, and uh, we don't read enough of the Proverbs. I kind of agree. I think yeah, Proverbs is such a great place to go every day, and you're going to always get something profound every day in Proverbs. Yeah, the book of Proverbs is all about the values that mean, that are on the heart of God. They're, they're values that you can go to and, and see them played out in, in real life. I mean, it, chapter 2 talks about the importance of wisdom, for instance. And David's actually talking to Solomon when he was a child and tells him that he needs to value wisdom. I've probably preached more on the Proverbs than I have on the Psalms. Mm-hmm. Not that I don't love the Psalms, I do. But what I like about the Proverbs is they're very terse. They're very much to the point. They don't beat around the bush, and they say, this is what you got to do, and here's why you do it. And uh, I just preached on that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. It's powerful. You know, big thing is what I'm trying to help people understand is how you actually go do that. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why Solomon, at the age of, they say, around 18, 17, 18 years old, when given the opportunity to ask anything of the Lord, sought for wisdom. Where did he get that? How many 18-year-olds do you know would go ahead and say, well, that's actually what I want? So you, you see in chapter 4, Proverbs, Hear, O sons, a father's instruction. This is David now talking to his sons, and Solomon in particular. And be attentive that you may gain insight, for I give you good pre- precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. And then he talks about get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. So he develops a value, even as a young boy, for wisdom. And so when given the opportunity, it was passed on by his father its importance, and he asked for wisdom. I love, uh, by the way, Proverbs 8. Uh, Generally, the title on that is Wisdom's Call. But remember, in the New Testament, Jesus says that, or I'm sorry, Paul writes that Jesus is the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians one twenty five. Read Proverbs 8 sometime and think of wisdom as being Christ and see if it changes your understanding of that chapter. Mm-hmm. I like that. Many uh, times in the past, I would preach on this Old Testament verse or verses. I remember one older woman coming out and she goes, I've been reading the Bible all my life. So what is wisdom and how do you put it to work? And she caught me off guard. I was a young pastor. Mm-hmm. Oh, I got to think about this. What I finally came back with, and what I've been teaching ever since, is that wisdom is taking the truth of God's word revealed in Jesus and applying it directly to your life, your circumstances, your thinking, your behavior. Because the Lord wants that in the way we treat one another and the way we act. The problem is, most of us react out of our emotion or out of the circumstances rather than acting out of the Lord's wisdom. You know, and in the educational pursuits that many of us have been involved in, all education can do is help you uh, bring uh, some sort of semblance out of knowledge, and but it can't give you wisdom. Right. And so it says in James that we can ask for wisdom and God will give it to us. 
that true wisdom comes from the heart of God, from my point of view. Yeah. So it's what I was referencing, the scales, Proverbs 16, 11, the Lord demands accurate scales and balances. He sets the standards for fairness. Mm -hmm. That's why I grew up in Toledo. <laughs> the best scale system in the world, Toledo scales. Everywhere yep. in the world. I was in India. They had Toledo scales there. Really? Yes. Oh, that's I'm, a brand. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's oh. called Toledo scales. Cool. Bill, what are your favorite Proverbs? Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> mine, I've got a trifecta, and they start with Proverbs 18.2, a fool delights in airing his own opinions. Hmm. Now, this is all kind of what I think about every time I come into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> when we're here. Exactly. Proverbs, so much better. Proverbs 15.5 says, a fool hates correction. Yeah. And Proverbs 12.15 says, the fool thinks he's right all the time. So those are my th my my three go tos, which I always kind of have in my mind when I walk into the studio. I, I have no interest in delighting. I'm, I have no interest in airing my own opinions. I, I'm I'm always open to being corrected, and I al always um, I never think I'm right all the time. You know, if I'm standing on the Word of God, that's correct, that's right. Um, but I always want to handle the Word of God well. You know, you can be ignorant um, for a lack of knowledge. You can be ignorant on purpose, but what you're referring to in Proverbs is being arrogantly ignorant. You're arrogant about your ignorance. You don't want your mind changed. Mm -hmm. Good point. And the other one I really like is Proverbs 19.3, which is a man's own foolish acts destroy his life, but his heart is angry with the Lord. Oh, it's like you, boy, you blow up your own up. life, and then you're mad at God. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I Why see didn't you stop me, Lord? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a common refrain in Christian counseling. You know, why did the Lord let this happen? Why did the Lord do this? Yeah. You know, and my attitude is, well, if you would have been driving 90 miles an hour or drinking the alcohol, yeah. you wouldn't have gone over the cliff. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs 18.21 is death and life are in the power of the tongue. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. Boy, that's the truth. Yeah. What wow. people say have greater impact than anything else I've ever seen in people's lives. For good or bad. For good or bad. Yeah. And, you know, I think most of us in leadership need to go out of our way in the church and in society and single out or find those people that are the least likely to be getting, you know, encouragement or whatever and speak to them the Lord's words of life and let them know they're valuable. They have a place in the kingdom of God, but not enough people get that. It says in James chapter 3, verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that teach will judge with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and we end up stumbling what he says, he is a perfect man, and so forth. But it talks about, it says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Mm. Wow. I think there's something here, like, Tom, like you were just describing, about the power of people's words. You know, the old adage, sticks and stones and stuff. No, no words can cause damage, Right. Uh, and they do have power. Words and meanings do have power. When you think of this from God's perspective, think of it now in an internal perspective, that the tongue has the power of life and death. When we proclaim the gospel of salvation, it does have a power of life. For those who hear it and believe it, they can be saved. When we don't, it's the power of death. So our words and the truths that we communicate about God are literally can mean life or death to the world. Yeah, it goes on in James and says, for every kind of beast and bird or reptile or sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. I've been amazed at how many people all through my ministry would come to me for counseling and be in their bill in their 60s and 70s and tears are running down their eyes. And I'm saying, what is it at the depth of your being that the Lord's trying to root out or deal with? And I have heard them say time and time again, my father never said he loved me. Or my mm. father said I was a mistake. Ouch. And believe me, that sticks with people. Think of that time when Jesus is coming out of the waters of baptism and the heavens open, a dove descends, and the voice of God says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Wow. So if, a, if an earthly son doesn't hear from his father, you're my son, I love you, I'm proud of you, you can spend the rest of your life looking for that. Absolutely. And, and here's what I tell men, especially fathers. If you're 80 years old and you've got a 60-year-old son and you've never said that and they live across country, we have telephones. Pick them up and say, I haven't said this, but I'm going to say it now. I'm proud of you. I love you. You're the best thing that ever happened in my life. And believe me, it is a powerful, powerful life changer for people. It's so wrong to say, well, my son or my daughter knows I love them. No, you mm -hmm. need to tell them more than once that you love them. 
Good word. Mm. We'll take a break and be back with lots more guy talk. If you have a question or comment, I'd love to hear 877-933-2484. Again, 877-933-2484. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Drive time, drive time, let's get it started. Jump in your car, yeah. what's for dinner? Yeah. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. One of my favorite times of the week is right now, and it's called Guy Talk, or Guys Who Talk. And what we do is we gather around the studio table, Bibles are open, and we try to answer any questions you have. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Text the question over, and we'll do our best to answer it. My panel is Greg B., Tom P., and Jeff V. I go, they go by uh, Greg Borgond, Tom Parrish, Jeff Verdorn. All right, gentlemen, what advice would you give believers who grew up in the church and have been wired to measure faith by contrition and repentance? Say that again. What advice would you give believers who grew up in the church and have been wired to measure faith by contrition and repentance? So it sounds like your faith is going to be measured by how you have repented and I don't know. It, uh, yeah, I understand, what they're, I understand what they're saying because I see this in a lot of elderly people, especially grew up in the Lutheran church, that somehow they think that it's the confession of repentance that makes everything work. And I keep trying to tell them, it's your submission to Jesus. It's loving him, trusting what he has done. Now, does repentance and that come into it? Sure. But that isn't making the relationship. That's because of the relationship. So for this individual, uh, if they're talking with somebody and they feel this way about it, I would simply come back and start asking them, well, tell me what Jesus really means to you. What has Jesus really done for you? And, and try to get them to think through biblically what the real purpose of salvation or where it really comes from. It's not through our repentance and that kind of thing. It's through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that a lot, Tom. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith. It's a great passage to define what faith is. And, and it says, now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of things unseen. And so faith, as you you often say on this program, faith, it can be as small as a mustard seed. It's the object yes. of our faith. That is so important. And when you are trusting in him and you're putting your faith in him, suddenly now you're, you're trusting in his power and not your own. So there's something about that that's, that, like you just described, is putting the onus back on you, if you will, when we should be yeah. trusting in him and his power. Absolutely. There's a phrase that's often been used to describe uh, the only time I feel close to the Lord is recognizing I'm a terrible sinner and I need to repent, and I need to be contrite. That's called uh, worm theology. Mm. What we don't necessarily see oftentimes, that God has prepared a purpose for our life, that he's superintended our formation, that he has designs for us, that we are to live a life of holiness that will honor him. And so God sees much in us, and worm theology sees little in us. So anything good that happens to us, that's of God. Anything bad that happens to us, well, that's my fault. It's not like that. I agree. All right, here's another sin confession question. Do we need to confess our sins, or do we need to thank God for forgiving our sins and repent instead of confess? Is that a word salad? No. Okay. No, no. Uh, confession for a non-believer is acknowledging Christ's finished work on the cross. Confession for a believer is restoring broken fellowship with our Heavenly Father. So it's just simply saying that the choice I made dishonors the standards that you have set, Lord. I apologize for that, and I thank you for what you already accomplished at the cross. Through the power of your Spirit, may I bring honor to uh, me being a member of your family. May I bring honor to you. That's confession for a Christian. I like it. That's exactly right. I wish more people understood that, Greg. And I hear a lot of that thankfulness in your heart that he has forgiven you, which is kind of the second half of that question there, right? Mm -hmm. We did light up the text line a little bit with some people that like Proverbs. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's a hot topic. 
Uh, Good. Proverbs 15, 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We certainly don't see any of that in the world today, right? <laughs> you know, again, in my ministry with men, I tell them that you control the temperature of your environment. Instead of being a thermometer that merely registers somebody else's anger or frustration, you need to be a thermostat that controls it. And so you can lower the temperature in the room by adjusting, just as you're talking about, Bill, that passage, adjusting how you're coming across. A soft answer doesn't mean it's an uh, impotent answer. It simply means it's a soft answer. Well, and it's where the wisdom in the answer comes from, because the wisdom is seeking redemption. It is not seeking to put the other person down or to destroy them in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we respond in gentleness, grace with truth, always in gentleness, always let your conversation be seasoned uh, with grace, as Paul says. Um, do not repay evil with evil. Um, you know, build each other up, encourage one another. I mean, there's all kinds of exhortations in Scripture that that reflect or exhort to us, I should say, of how we should be responding, communicating, and treating others. When I was teaching an adult class this last Sunday, I said to them when they were talking about we were dealing with worldviews and how do we engage the worldviews and how do we go ahead and present the gospel, I said, don't ever use second person singular, second person plural, because the minute you say you need to do this, or you should do that. Already you're putting them on the defense. That's not a soft answer. Use it the first person or third person. I experience it this way. This is what God's done in my life. Or if I were dressing a crowd, I would share with them this. But I encourage people in this Western culture today, stay away from first person you or first person uh, or plural you. Mm -hmm. It bugs me when people speak in the third person. You'll never hear Bill Arnold do that. <laughs> Just, I'm just going to make that clear with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, Good one. Here's a question. I'm wondering if a person dies and goes to heaven before a loved one that isn't saved, can that person uh, pray f for that other person when you're in heaven? That's a great question. I, I, I don't know. know of anything in Scripture that talks about that. Do any of you guys? No, I don't. Mm -mm. So all we'd be displaying here is ignorance. What I do know <laughs> is that for the unbeliever that still hasn't come to the Lord— um, the Lord knows they need to be saved. It is his will that everyone be saved, and he's going to be working overtime to save that person way beyond anything I could ever do in heaven. Mm. So in heaven, I'm going to enjoy being there and leave it all up to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it doesn't say so explicitly in Scripture, but when when we're in heaven, um, we're not going to be viewing like a big theater what's going on down on earth and so praying for somebody, a relative that hasn't come to Christ yet, would lead you with the implication that that's indeed the case. But I don't see anywhere in Scripture, do you? That no, but wait, I was at a funeral where it said, and we know Bob is up in that bowling alley in the sky, <laughs> looking down at us from heaven, you know? That's not true? <laughs> no. Oh, man. You Boy, get a strike? <laughs> <laughs> we do whatever we can do, though, to meet the emotional needs at the time. So they make up these ridiculous stories, and it's so sad. And my heart breaks when I hear that. Mm. You know, he's finally with his, you know, he's at his favorite fishing hole in heaven, finally. Finally, oh. I'm going, how do you know that? This man never professed faith in Christ, never went to church, and and was a, a vile person. One uh, of the great truths of Scripture is that there are two roads. There's two gates. There's two destinies. Uh, there's uh, the wise and the foolish. Um, you know, you don't have to get very far in Scripture to know that God has set before us two paths. I, you know, choose this day who you will serve, uh, Joshua says, as, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How long will you waver between these two? If God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. I mean, this choice uh, between those who have Christ Jesus and have life and those who do not have Christ Jesus and don't have life. We think about all the questions we're going to ask God when we get to heaven, all the concerns we have on this earth that we finally get answers to. But my sense is, is that when we're in the presence of Jesus Christ in his lordship and his majesty, mm. many of those questions are going to dissipate like a mist. Mm. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. We're we'll take a little break, come back with more Guide Talk. Let me know what question you have. Great questions coming in. As always, you're the smartest listeners in the world, and we're going to Look forward to taking your question at 877-933-2484. We'll be right back.
If you'd like to know more about what it means to begin a relationship with Christ or to chat with someone about it, just text the word FAITH to 41224. All right, we've got one more segment of Guy Talk, so we still have time for your questions. Send it over, 877-933-2484. Here's a question, gentlemen. Isn't there something in the Bible about confessing to your brothers, and that will change your heart? Well, we're told to confess our sins to one another. one another. So Mm -hmm. that is there. Will the confession itself change your heart? I think it's the beginning step especially if you've offended your brother mm-hmm. or if you've got something to share. But ultimately, the forgiveness we're after is the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just the other person. But there is a step involved, and I think we've got to be careful in Christianity not to think that when we've offended somebody else, all we got to do is go to Jesus and repent and skip the person. Sometimes you got to go back to them, but there are other times when, yeah, you got to start with them and confess to them and bring the Lord into it. I think one of the things about confessing to others is, see what you guys think about this. I think sin loves darkness. Mm -hmm. And when you bring it to light, when you confess it to others who you trust, I mean, just don't go around, you know, if you have a trusted group of other believers, I think bringing it to the light has a healing effect and a power it does. Uh, to help you repent from those things. Yeah, but you you talk about it in a way that a general concept. I'm, there's sometimes confessing your sin out loud to another, they may not be ready to hear it. True. It could be a, a, you know, they could be tripped up over your own confession. So what you said about trusted brothers mm-hmm. is really important because you just can't share what's on your heart. You might feel release, but you left the weight of it on somebody else's shoulders that may not have the capacity to handle that burden. All right, gentlemen, do we go to heaven when we die, or do we go to sleep and we all go to heaven together after Jesus comes back? This is a great question uh, because Jesus actually uses the term sleep for like Lazarus. He says, well, he's not really dead. He's just asleep. And so this this term is used. But I think from the New Testament, from Paul's writing, we know, I think 100%, uh, that w- the moment you die, we are absent from the body, as Paul says, and at home or present with the Lord. Paul says, it's better for me to depart, to die, and be with the Lord by far, he says. So I think we can conclude from the New Testament that the moment a believer dies, he is immediately with the Lord in heaven. Yeah, there's no immediate step. Consciously, says in, by the yeah, way. Yeah, no immediate yeah. step, it says in Scripture, that you go to sleep right. for a period of time that all of a sudden you're awakened. Right. Do, does the, the term rest in peace, though, have biblical origins? I'm in Isaiah 57, verse 2, that says, He enters into peace, they rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. Is there a, a biblical origin I, I, of the word rest in peace? I think I've read where that does have the phrase rest in peace has a, is biblical. There's, there's a lot of things that are biblical that come from the Bible. Like, our, you know, men have Adam's apple, you know, and they're th- where does that come from? Well, Adam ate the apple, and so men have an Adam's apple kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> doubting Thomas <laughs> comes from... No, that's true. That's, okay. No, I'm with you, Joe. Okay. Uh, my mind just went a one, completely different direction. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the rest of peace, there's a lot of common expressions that come from Scripture. I think that is one of them. But here's the thing. We use it to to as to whether they're saved or not. We might say, I hope they rest in peace. Well, that passage that you just read is for the righteous. It's for believers. And we know they will rest in peace. I think that's specifically a description of those who died and went to the comfort side of Hades and now are up in heaven and with the Lord. I, I think it even goes even beyond that, that the burdens that we carry while living on earth, the weight of our responsibilities, all of that, we're released from that when we go to be with the Lord. And so we that's have the rest. peace. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's the rest, and it's finally there's peace. There's no more warfare going on internally or externally with our souls. All right, gentlemen, uh, King David certainly had his share of both blessings and difficulties. Mm-hmm. There? Um, and usually some of his most heartfelt psalms of praise and thanksgiving were in the midst of trouble. And I'm in Psalm uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Isn't that beautiful? That's Mm -hmm. gorgeous. You know, the beauty of of David's heart, the reason why it says in Acts 13.22 that David was a man after God's heart because he did everything that I asked him to do. And so you say to yourself, well, how can that be? He had an affair with Bathsheba, he numbered his troops, um, he didn't manage his family well. It was his heart. Remember, it says in Scripture that God looks at the motives of men's hearts. And you hear it coming out in just what you read, Bill. Here's another one, a very short psalm, 13. And he has this, this amazing relationship with God that he can spill his soul. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over you, lest my foes rejoice before I am shaken. But he ends this way, even after that despairing comment, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Mm. That's David's heart. Yeah. <clears throat> what about anyone listening to, t- tonight that is feeling fear and anxiety? And I, my heart right now is for those who are in a, port- a, a crossroad or a, an intersection in life where they don't know what the next step is and they're uncertain what the results might be or what the outcome is going to be and they're they're trapped in some fear and i i just i just want to pray for people yeah. in that position right now would one or two of you pray right now sure lord jesus when we get in these situations and fear comes in and we don't know what to do lord drive us to yourself we put this at your feet your sacrifice for us can take away the fear and lord even though we can't see the answer we know you are the answer and that you will guide us to what is good for the kingdom of god so our confidence is in you give us inner peace jesus at this very moment lord you say you did not give us a spirit of fear but of power and so lord we just uh, trust in you we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know that you are the one who holds tomorrow. So we don't worry about this day. We don't worry about our life, but we 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 have we are anxious for nothing. But through thanksgiving and prayer, we trust in you. Yes. We pray, Lord, that you would be alongside everyone's journey, wherever they're at right now, that you will be with them in kindness and, and mercy and comfort and grace. Mm-hmm. And we thank you for your faithfulness and your promises in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Another one, a uh, listener jumped in and said, uh, you know, Psalm 119, it's a great uh, scripture for a struggling Christian. Psalm 119, not mm-hmm. to mention the longest yeah, it is. psalm that we have. Mm-hmm. But that's a, a great psalm to, to read, study, look at. It is. Psalm 119. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I quote from that often where the passage is... Um, it talks about just your walk with God. It talks about struggle. It talks about everything that we face. And it is the longest book of the Bible, but it, it, it can give you hope. Isn't Psalm 118 the very center of the Bible, if I remember right? I don't remember. I, don't I know have that. read that. I've read that. I don't know if it's true, though. I don't know either. Mm-hmm. And verse 14 supposedly ha- is the precise center. And it says this, uh, in fact, the second half of vor- verse 14, which says, He has become my salvation. Hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I don't know if that's exactly the center or not, but it's a great story. Yes. Well, he has become right my salvation. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, gentlemen, I have to say another robust two hours of guy talk. I do enjoy this. I look forward to this every week. And I know that uh, everyone who tunes in walks away with something. And I hope always in my prayers, we rightly handle the word of God. And hmm. there are yeah. certainly people that listen to the program that have issues with how we respond to the answers and mm-hmm. disagreements. And I understand that. And I, I'm, you know, I guess we're doing what the Holy Spirit leads us to do and answer the way in which the Holy Spirit leads us to le- to answer based on the word of God. So yeah. any closing thoughts? We've got 10 seconds. No, that was a great word, Bill. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Because we do get pushback from uh, some of our answers on the text line and 
I get that. And well, you know, it's all, it's all in the, with the idea we have to understand we're all in the process of becoming it, not having arrived. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're, not claiming, uh, yep. we're not claiming that we know absolute truth and that you ought to just listen to exact. Check us out in the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Check the Word of God. All right. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.